Hey everyone, Sparrow here. Thanks for stopping by for another episode of True North Sanctuary. Today we'll be building the entrance to the left side of the zoo, a nicely forested area with a river running through it, and plenty of nooks and crannies for guests to explore as they stroll through the trees. Right next to the start of the path, we're going to have two exhibits, American Bullfrogs and Diamondback Terrapins. Now, neither of these animals are native to Alberta, but the animal roster for the other American zoo I have planned was getting quite full, so I decided True North would be their home. We'll talk about some reasons why in just a bit, but let's chat about the idea behind this build first. As you can see, I've added a bathroom to this building to give guests a much needed pit stop before they wander the woods, and it will also make the building slightly longer to screen this section of the zoo off more from the entrance. I'm building the outline with concrete walls and panels, but this entire building is actually going to be covered with rocks and moss and ivy and all of the natural things, like these logs that will frame the entrance to the bathroom. Once these are up, we're going to cover the entirety of the concrete with tiger rock cladding because it's the thinnest rock available and takes up the most surface area. Since this building won't have a backstage, just an implied entrance, we also don't need to worry about the rocks clipping through the walls on the other side. With that, let's jump into the reasoning behind these two exhibit animals. American bullfrogs are native to parts of Canada, including southern Ontario, southern Quebec, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia. They are also considered invasive in British Columbia, where they were originally introduced for frog leg farming, but they quickly got out of control. So while they're not found in Alberta, they do have a presence somewhere in Canada. Oh, and here is the implied entrance. I set some rocks in on top of it so you can only see the handle and the door outline. A lot of zoos mask their doors this way so it doesn't break the immersion for guests. But anyway, I'm getting distracted. Let's talk terrapins. Diamondback terrapins can't be found in Canada at all, but they do have a large range stretching as far south as the Florida Keys and as far north as Cape Cod, which isn't that far from Nova Scotia. The reason why I wanted to include them in this zoo specifically though has more to do with the fact that we don't have an exhibit tortoise, and terrapins are about the closest animal we do have without moths. Tortoises, or more specifically tortoise shells, are important artifacts to the indigenous peoples of Canada and North America in general. This is because tortoise shells could be used as a calendar. There are 13 large segments in the middle of the shell, and around the edge there are 28 smaller divisions. There are also 13 full moons in the calendar year, with 28 days in each one. So on a tortoise shell, you can mark one of the large middle sections on the full moon, and then go all the way around the edge of the shell, marking off the smaller sections, and that will get you to the next full moon. And this gives a way to track the migration of animals, the growing seasons, the season seasons, and so on. Full moons have various names in different groups and have largely been adopted by the Farmer's Almanac, but some examples include the Snow Moon in February, also known as the Hunger Moon, Flower Moon in May, also known as the Corn Planting Moon, and the Hunter's Moon in October, also known as the Travel Moon. The best known one is probably the Harvest Moon, or Barley Moon, which is the full moon closest to the autumnal equinox. So there we go. I find it so fascinating how nature has all of these connections within it. Who knew a tortoise shell would follow the moon cycle? It's just, oh, it's just so cool. Let's get back to the build. Going to take a short break here from the viewing windows to add more rocks to the side of the building. Eventually, I think there will be a map of the zoo standing in this corner so guests have a place to stop, plan their visit, and then continue on their way. Haven't designed a zoo map yet because I want to have at least two sections of the zoo complete before I attempt to do that in Illustrator, but it will be coming. To add more interest to the viewing windows of the exhibits, I used the faux tree pieces to break up the very square piece of glass. Tried recoloring on one side of the building, but there was only shadow, so I copied one over to the sunny side to get the color just right against the tiger rocks and then applied it. Didn't want to have the same silhouette for both windows, so I played around with a lot of different pieces. Wasn't happy with the way it looked for a while before remembering there are also faux tree branches, which I ended up using here. I had the worst time with the rotation on this one. Again, maybe depth perception issues or rotational geometry in middle and high school failed me, but it did finally get to the right spot. The bottom branch happened so much more quickly. Building in the air is just clearly not for me. Covering up the remainder of the exhibit box before we go into 
the settings to make sure the bullfrogs and terrapins have enough enrichment items, their enclosures have the correct temperature and humidity, and closing off the back windows with the 2D facade. I could have sworn there was a 3D one, but I wasn't finding it here for some reason. Maybe it's only for certain animals. Usually I'll also go in and add additional plants or branches to the exhibits to give them a little more clutter, make them a bit more natural looking and not the same, but these two I thought were already looking quite good, so I left them alone for now. We of course also need our educational signage, so I sank the exhibit sign into the faux tree trunks on either side, which should be at about eye level for guests, and then we're going to figure out the roof. So I tried the same flat roof as what we have over on the Prairie Dog building, which I thought worked alright with the rock exterior, but none of the browns were working, they just seemed too bright. While I figured out what to do with that, here's a pro tip. The bathroom blocks are recolorable, so I made mine shades of brown to better blend in with the logs and rocks around it. In that brief intermission, I figured that since the exterior of this building is going to be mossy and covered with ivy, why not also have a green roof? These grass panels are from the conservation pack. I layered them over the other panels and sunk them in a bit. Makes it feel man-made still, like someone had to come up onto the roof and put turf and plantings down. The added benefit of green roofs like this is that they provide a filter for stormwater runoff or, more importantly in our case in Alberta, snow melt. They can help regulate temperature and humidity levels, which is perfect for exhibit animals, and they lower energy costs and increase the lifespan of the roof, which is great for the sanctuary's bank account. We'll be covering the building with ivy next, which is technically considered invasive, but between ivy, wisteria, and virginia creeper as the options, I thought it worked best for the overgrown, swampy forest vibe that I want for this building. I tried using as many of the regular ivy parts, not the variegated this time, as possible. I don't think I've used the patches before, but I did very much like the outcome. My favorite part about the look of ivy is how it climbs everything and just covers every inch, which admittedly is terrible for building infrastructure, but it does look great. Just slowly taking over every inch of this building. Since it is invasive, I also have some growing further from the building on that pile of rocks, almost as if it hasn't been pruned back in a while. And finally, we'll plant up the roof with plenty of low-growing plants such as moss, which should help to catch escaping humidity, some sparse bracken, and a few ferns. Super limited palette, there's not much growing up here, and we'll just place it haphazardly like it hasn't been taken care of in a while. Because who wants to whip out a ladder and get up there on the regular? <laughs> I certainly don't. A quick 360 to see the build and then we're off to our next project. The waterfall. If you're here because of the short promo I put up a few days ago, this is how that waterfall came together. Check out the link on the screen if you haven't. Unfortunately, it wasn't as easy as setting up a camera and watching things appear in place. First things first, the rock work. I don't know how many rocks there are here, but my computer definitely doesn't like it. I'm going to guess hundreds to maybe 2,000, all things considered. I did cut out a lot of the speed build here because you probably don't want to watch me place rocks for half an hour, and if you do, my apologies, let me know in the comments. So we're going to go around this entire lake and the river coming out of it with Tiger Rock number 4, which is nice and flat and can be layered, but thicker than the rock cladding because I don't even want to think about how many rocks it would have taken if I used those instead. This will form the base of the rocky terrain around the water, and then I'll go back in with other large rocks to fill it out, and finally some of the $5 stones to fill out gaps and make the rock walls more interesting. Over on the shore by the backstage area, I left a small gap because I thought I might put a water filtration system here, like a concrete platform with tanks on it that are easily accessible from the staff area, but that would have absolutely ruined the view from the bridge, so I might just put down a pipe there and screen it with some plants. So it looks like the water here is taken care of and maintained properly, but it's not an eyesore. I know this probably looks like a lot, but this entire build, everything you're seeing in this video, took about 4 hours? Which you can probably tell from the length of the video as well, because it's quite a bit shorter than the others. Like I've mentioned previously, I just kind of spammed rocks everywhere. Truly everywhere this time around. <laughs> Once the rocks are placed, it's time for the waterfall. Now one thing I do with small parts like this is I create a sign off to the side and label what group it belongs to. Then I add all of the effects to the group and when I need to edit the group, I just need to find the sign for it, which is easy enough to hide under bushes or rocks or whatever else. No more hunting for the little water effect nozzles. 
Back to the waterfall. I think I tried to make this work about five or six times. I even looked up videos on YouTube sh to try to figure it out, but they were all of tall waterfalls and that's not what I wanted. So I just muddled my way through, looked at a few pictures of shorter waterfalls or rapids, and somehow this came together. Since this is more of a ledge and not a true waterfall, I used the rapids splash effect instead of the waterfall ones, other than at the bottom to make the river look like it's flowing forward. Just place them where it felt like the water would be chopping over rocks and, well, it worked. This larger waterfall right in front of the bridge was more similar to the ones I saw on YouTube, but still a pain to make. Even asked for help in some of the Discord servers I'm in, and other builders were very helpful in trying to help me out with this waterfall. So at first I tried the waterfall midsection, but I found I had to stick the nozzle portion of the special effect quite far out, and there was no real way to hide it. After experimenting with that for a while, I added the bottom of the waterfall instead, because having both the top and the bottom would let me see what space the middle portion needs to fill in how realistic it looks. I finally settled on using the jets, and a lot of them, to pour water over the edge. Once I had the first one angled to my liking, I copied it over a bunch of times to fill out the waterfall, and then copied the entire row and moved it slightly forward and sideways to fill in the remaining gaps. I think it gives the illusion of a pretty full waterfall other than the rocks sticking out from the wall behind it. I moved those forward so they are more visible, because that's something you would see in a real waterfall. Overall, I am very happy with how this turned out, even though it makes my file lag like no tomorrow. I might blueprint both the rapids and this waterfall and keep them out of the file for now so I can build the next enclosures in peace. So really, we're on to the finishing touches. First, a bunch of faux aquatic rocks around the edges and on the river bottom. I discovered thanks to Adam Up Gaming that there is a thread on the Steam discussion boards and also Reddit titled Aquatic Rock Color Codes. I did still tweak them a bit, but it gave a great starting point for recoloring the rocks. We're planting up the edges using the trusty TNS undergrowth palette created using a tag in the nature tab. Plenty of arrowwood, bramble bushes, bracken, ferns, nettles, and mosses to round out the look. For trees, I'm looking for larger, bushier ones to hide the view of the staff buildings behind the lake. We don't want guests seeing too much of the backstage, though the greenhouse does look quite pretty. Could also extend the wall on the other side to hide things a little bit, but I like working with the sight lines from the guest paths on this side and figuring out what will screen the view nicely. And there you have it, a lovely view from the bridge onto the newly created falls. I had so much fun and frustration with this build. While we're not going to go on a tour of our little build today, here are some updates from True North Sanctuary. The staff have some new outfits featuring the blues of the logo, some of the brown wood colors found around the zoo, and a green from the Tiger Rock highlights to give the zookeepers a more park ranger-like feel. Thank you to Andre Spera 114 for that amazing idea. We also have two baby prairie dogs with many more on the way. They are just the cutest animals and so small. Say hello to Milo and his sister Lola, who is quite literally running circles around him. Some new signage has been added to direct visitors to the two main parts of the sanctuary. Our prairie dogs bison and pronghorns are part of the prairie pathway, while the exhibits built today stand at the front of the next section, which is Woodland Walk. The bullfrogs and terrapins are having a grand old time, and since I'm a fan of naming animals after other animals, say hello to Bear, the male bullfrog, and Pip, the female bullfrog. They're just hanging out in their exhibit. This is Pip's favorite lily pad. I love how they blink with both eyes at the same time. The terrapins have been dubbed Goose and Kit. Even though they're not the tortoises I wanted, I think they'll fit in just fine here at True North. I love when they just float around in the water. Not a care in the world. Just look at her. I wish that were me. Here's a quick look at where we started today. And this is where we ended up. That corner is starting to feel a lot more full. Thanks for joining me today at True North Sanctuary. If you liked the video, make sure to leave a like or comment. And if you'd like, check out the community tab on my channel to vote for which enclosure you would like to see next. Thank you to all of my lovely subscribers, new and returning. Your support means the world to me. See you next time. Bye.